Shri Advaita Gadadhara Sri Vatsali Gauru Bhakta Vrindaki Sri Sri Radha Krishna Gopa Gopinath Shankun Radha Kunda Giri Govardhana Ki Jai Vrindavan Dham Ki Jai Mathura Dham Ki Jai Mayapur Navani Dham Ki Jai Jagarath Puri Dham Ki Jai Ganga Mai Ki Jai Yamuna Mai Ki Jai Tulsi Devi Ki Jai Bhakti Devi Ki Jai Samaveda Bhakta Vrindaki all glories to the assembled all glories to the assembled all glories to the assembled all glories to Sri Sri
As soon as I start seeing the eyes drop, uh, I'll definitely try to simplify. <laughs> so, uh, again, it's, it's a pleasure and a privilege to share these teachings of uh, my or our spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who came from India uh, with about seven dollars in his pocket and, uh, and lived a rather austere life in New York City for a while and gathered a small following. And uh, the teachings that he presented are the ancient Vedic teachings. Veda means knowledge. And uh, what we are presenting is the knowledge of the ancient scriptures, the ancient texts, one of which is 5,000 years old, known as the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad, which is what I'll be speaking from tonight. Bhagavad means <clears throat> uh, God, and Gita means song. So this is the song of God, and it's also mentioned as it is. Uh, that was put in very specifically because many of the Bhagavad Gita's are not as they are supposed to be, but often as according to interpretations of persons who have a particular, uh, <clears throat> who have a particular issue or or a particular uh, um, prejudice that they particular have in mind, which they want to bring or foist upon persons. Um, so Srila Prabhupada wanted to make that very clear. We have what we call a disciplic succession. It all started from Lord Krishna, who appeared in India 5,000 years ago, approximately. And uh, this book, as most of you already know, but some of you may not know, uh, the contents of the, of the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of God, uh, are the results of what took place on a battlefield in India called Kurukshetra, just preceding a very great war, what known as the Battle of Kurukshetra, in which literally millions of persons were involved. It was truly a fight of uh, good against evil. I won't go into the details. But before the battle started, one of the chief generals, namely Arjun, who was on the the good guy's side, uh, he became a little antsy, a little uh, uh, anxious, a little uncertain, and he said to Krishna, please, Krishna very kindly uh, had taken the position of his charioteer. Uh, he is the Supreme Lord. Nonetheless, he, it was not beneath him to take the position of a uh, humble chariot uh, driver of his friend. Arjun was a friend of his. He was his cousin. And he was also his teacher. He was, because he was the Supreme Lord acting as an ordinary human being, although at times he did display himself as being quite extraordinary, lifting up an entire mountain on his little pinky when he was seven years old. Uh, swallowing the whole forest fire. Now these are just starters. <laughs> and there are many other miracles that he performed. Uh, whenever the residents of Vrindavan, where he lived, uh, were in difficulty or had troubles or there were tribulations or there were threats uh, or dire disasters approaching, so his business was to save his devotees from harm, from problems, from death, and uh, this is what he states himself to be. First of all, he says, whenever and wherever there is a decline in religious practice and a predominant rise of irreligion, at that time I descend to this world to deliver the pious and to, uh, to deliver the pious and to annihilate the miscreants or the criminals. I myself appear uh, millennium after millennium. So he mentions that he appears in this world primarily to relieve the earth of some of the demoniac forces that are present on it. Uh, and 
the, the idea being is that when the demoniac forces become too great, then uh, people uh, become very uh, disturbed, very shaken, very rattled, very confused, and very uh, suspicious. There's no peace in the world. And if there's no peace in the world, then uh, everybody wants to fight everybody. That's the nature of a person who has no peace of mind. He's always uh, looking to, in some way, uh, in some way, to be a uh, a lord, to be important, to be valuable, to be great. And so, people are in this world to manifest their importance, or their strength, or their power, or their greatness. And if they do that in a proper, moral, ethical fashion, then everything moves smoothly and, and everything moves nicely. People respecting one another the way it should be done. However, when um, evil begins to take over, then respect for other human beings uh, becomes lost. So what Krishna came to do is uh, to set things in motion and to get a king or an emperor who was a represent, representative of him, who, who was all virtuous. Uh, he did not have, King Yudhishthir uh, did not have uh, evil qualities. But the, one of the reigning kings had many evil qualities, lust and anger and greed, <clears throat> illusion, mostly envy. And his attempt, when I say his, I mean Duryodhana's attempt, was to deny the Pandavas, the five brothers, who are on the good guy's side, the right to their property, which their father had left them. And so by various devious machinations, he was able to take over their property, gambling match, and then he had made a deal with the Pandavas after they lost all their property, as a result of the opposite side cheating, that he would return the property if they could um, live 12 years in the forest and one year in a kingdom incognito, so that nobody would know who they were. If they could fulfill those terms, then he would give the property back. So they did fulfill those terms. And then they said, okay, time for our property. He said he would give it back. He changed his mind, which is what envious, hostile, brutal people will do. They will say one thing and mean another thing. That was simply to forestall, to keep them away in the hope that people would forget them and would come to appreciate this Duryodhana who, as I said, at his rule and would accept his rule. So the result was is that uh, he said he would not give as much land back to them as a pin could fit on it. In other words, he would give virtually nothing. So... Uh, this was discussed, and Krishna said that this was improper, this was wrong. Uh, they had gone, he had gone back on his word, and uh, he, Krishna urged the Pandavas first, let me see if I can negotiate a settlement so that I can maybe help him to make uh, understand that this is not the way to live, this is not the way to act, this is not the way a leader should show his, himself. Because whatever a great man does, common men follow. Whatever standards he sets by exemplary acts, all the world pursues, all the world follows. So if a leader cheats, then the people, the, the subjects, they will cheat as well. So Krishna did discuss, he went back to Duryodhana, the known as the Kurus. Actually, they're all Kurus, but the Pandavas are Kurus too. They come from the Kuru dynasty, but they were differentiated by the fact that they, their father was named King Pandu, and Duryodhana's father was Dhritarashtra. So anyway, these were known as the Kurus and the Pandavas. Or the, uh, anyway, they refused, uh, Duryodhana and his brothers, he had a hundred brothers, they refused to yield, give any of the property 
of the landed kingdom back to the Pandavas who rightly deserved it. And the Pandavas were even willing to take just five villages, although they had a huge amount of land. But he would not give them anything. Due to his greed, due to his fear of them, he didn't want them to have any power. And they were what is known as warriors. So a warrior of that standing, of that category, is a leader. And he has to be given some... He leads people, he helps people, he guides people, he protects people. He, he amasses um, wealth and riches. So anyway, Duryodhana did not want to uh, give back anything. So it resulted in a declaration of war. That's what happened. So uh, once the declaration of war was, uh, was made, then uh, Duryodhana amassed his followers, and the Pandavas amassed theirs, and Krishna agreed to Arjuna's request to be his charioteer. Actually, it's a very interesting incident. Both Duryodhana and Arjuna went to where Krishna was taking rest. He was sleeping, and Duryodhana got there first, and Arjuna got there second, so Duryodhana sat right by the side of Krishna's face so that when he would wake up, he would immediately be there to tell him that I would like to have you and your army as my allies. But Arjun stood at the feet where Krishna was sleeping. He was standing at his feet. So when Krishna woke up, he saw Duryodhana on one side and Arjuna down at his feet where he was so he asked them, what, what is the purpose of your visit? And Duryodhana said, well, I would like to have, have, have you and your army on my side for this battle. So Krishna said, well, no. He said, no. I'm willing to offer my army, and I'm willing to offer myself, but not for battle. I will not fight in this battle. All I will do is that uh, uh, I will give you my army. The other person can have me as an advisor. So Duryodhana was very, uh, he, he, he was wondering what would happen. He'd say, well, I arrived here first, so can I make the request first? So Krishna said, no. He said, I, you may have arrived first, but I saw Arjuna first because he was, he was sitting by my feet. So uh, since I saw him first, I'll let him make the first request. Of course, it was... Uh, Arjun could have sat beside Duryodhana, just next to him, but he refused to do that. He rather liked to sit at the feet of Krishna, which is where a humble person generally will go when he's in the in the uh, in the company of a superior personality. So that's what he did. So Krishna said, "What would you like, Arjun?" So Arjun said, "Well, <clears throat> what I would like is I would like to have you." I would, uh, I prefer to have you as my, uh, as my advisor. So Duryodhana was very happy because that means he could get the army of Krishna. And he thought that numbers is everything. But Arjuna knew that with Krishna's power, he was more powerful than anyone in the entire world. And that if you had his favor, then it was a guarantee to win, Krishna himself says in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, my devotee will never perish. Anyway, <clears throat> I just wanted to set this, the, the, the mood and the tone of the verse that I'm about to uh, begin to read and the purport that I will be reading as well. At the beginning of the battles, Arjuna asked Krishna to uh, drive the, the chariot to the middle of the battlefield and Arjun looked at the opposite side. Now on the opposite side there were many of his relatives, there were friends, teachers, grandfathers. Uh, all of these people he were very dear to him. He loved them all. Uh, how do you go into battle and fight against persons whom you have affection for? How can you kill them? He was a very compassionate, very uh, kind, very uh, loving warrior. 
He was not just, you know, shoot to kill, kill as many people as you can. That was not the character of our Jew. He was a very cultured person. So he said to Krishna, I, I, I'm very, now I am confused about my duty and I've lost all composure due to miserly weakness. So what do I do? He said, you please uh, advise me. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. I'm confused about my duty. Or should I go and try and uh, kill people whom I love? So, now I'm confused about having lost all composure due to miserly weakness. In this condition, I'm asking you to tell me for certain what is best for me. Now I'm your disciple and a soul surrendered to you. So, tell me. So then Krishna began to tell him. And he told him, and it, it comes in the form of four, 700 verses which are in this book. And he advises him exactly. And he gives him an entire philosophy of life. I won't go into that any further, but what I would like to do is just, I want to read one of the verses in the second chapter. I'll read the Sanskrit as well as the English and also the commentary. And I will uh, try to explain in further detail what Srila Prabhupada himself has explained. Um, the most important point that uh, Krishna is going to be making in this is how to attain, how to achieve peace of mind in a world which is full of uh, miseries, which is full of difficulties, which is full of tribulations and problems. How do you achieve peace of mind in this? Especially now, here we have a, a big battle about to take place. So Krishna is about, <clears throat> has been telling him, actually, this is the 70th, uh, I believe it's the 70th verse. You know, the other light here? Anyway, I can use my flashlight, I think, if I can <coughs> read it. <coughs> yeah, this is the 70th verse. And what we have here is one aspect of how to achieve peace of mind. So if I can read this Sanskrit yet. Pur apuryamanam achala patishtam samudra mapa pravishanti yadva advatkamavam pravishanti sarve which is the one is always still, and alone achieve peace. And not the man who strives to satisfy such desire. Commentary. Purport by Prabhupada. Although the vast ocean is always filled with water, it is especially, it is always, especially during the rainy season, being filled with much more water. But the ocean remains the same, steady. It is not agitated, nor does it cross beyond the limit of its brink. That is also true of a person fixed in Krishna consciousness. As long as one has the material as long as one has the material body, the demands of the body for sense gratification will continue. The devotee, however, is not disturbed by such desires because of his fullness. A Krishna conscious man woman, is not in need of anything because the Lord fulfills all his material necessities. Therefore, he is like the ocean, always full in himself. Desires may come to him like the waters of the river that flow into the ocean, but he is steady in his activities, and he is not even slightly disturbed by desires for sense gratification. And I'll explain why in just a few moments.
That is the proof of a Krishna consciousness man. One who desires, one who has lost all inclination for material sense gratification. Although the desires are present, because he remains satisfied in the transcendental loving service of the Lord, he can remain steady like the ocean, therefore enjoy full peace. Others, however, who want to fulfill desires even up to the limit of liberation, that's spiritual liberation we're talking about, what to speak of material success, never attain peace. The fruit of workers, fruit of workers, a worker who works for personal pleasure, the fruit of workers, the salvationists, and also the yogis, or after mystic powers, are all unhappy because of unfulfilled desires. But the person in Krishna consciousness is happy in the service of the Lord, and he has no desires to be fulfilled. In fact, he does not even desire liberation from the so-called material bondage. The devotees of Krishna have no material desires, and therefore they are in perfect peace. Hasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. I was born in the darkness of ignorance, and my spiritual master opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. I offer my humble obeisances unto his lotus feet. So now I'd like to uh, comment on the commentary a little bit. What this is about. This particular verse, and I'll read it. I'll read the, the verse itself again. Uh, a person who is not disturbed by the incessant flow of desires that enter like rivers into the ocean, which is ever being filled but is always still, can alone achieve peace, and not the person who strives to satisfy such desires. So the desires that is being that are being talked about here are material desires, not spiritual desires. There are two types of desires, spiritual and material. Most people in the world today are focused upon or concentrated on fulfilling material desires. Now, the idea of fulfilling a material desire, whether it be something for the tongue, taste, or the ears, or the eyes, or the nose, or the skin, or the genitals, whatever it may be, it is a desire for some kind of pleasure. And Prabhupada mentions here that the reason there is a constant, if not a chronic, need to keep filling the body the mind, the senses with pleasure is because one is bereft uh, of inner pleasure. Inner pleasure comes from connecting with or contacting the Supreme Lord. That contact can be made in nine different ways, which I'll go into in a little while. But I, I would like to deal mostly with this material desires and what, what it does to us. Uh, no sooner do you fulfill whatever the material desire is, whether it's something, some type of food, some type of taste pleasure, or ear pleasure, or eye pleasure, whatever it is, <clears throat> if it gives pleasure, then what happens? It's internalized, goes into the conscious mind, the subconscious area, and it stays there for a while, and then at a later date, at another time, it, like a bubble, it comes up and it urges us, it pushes us, it moves us to try to fulfill that desire again. And the more we fulfill, or the more, the more we satisfy that particular desire, the more we become attached to that particular object of desire. 
And the more we become attached to the object of desire, uh, the more we begin to feel and think and believe that it's necessary for our happiness. And this is where the illusion comes in. Uh, for example, let us take uh, some particular food. Uh, let's take chocolate. Chocolate is always something that many people like. And you begin to uh, taste some chocolate and you like it. And then you later on, at another time, you take it again and you like it. And little by little you become um, attracted to it, habituated to it, and eventually you can become addicted to it. So that you feel that you cannot live a peaceful, happy, enjoyable life unless you have that chocolate. And this is, uh, uh, and in other words, the chocolate has become our master and we have become its slave. This is what happens. So as we become the slave of the of the chocolate, then can a slave ever really be happy? It's always, uh, now I'm, what I'm trying to bring out is that it's not only one thing like chocolate, it's countless things, like thousands of things that come into our lives, which we become attached to. <clears throat> Whether it's nice words from somebody, we want to hear compliments, or whether it's a beautiful body or a beautiful face, we want people to revere us or honor us, or whether it's wealth, you have a certain amount of money and people admire you, people look up to you, people uh, <clears throat> glorify you because you have so much wealth and money, and you have cars and airplanes and boats and things of this sort. And it gives you a sense of status, it gives you a sense of importance, it gives you a sense of, of, of <clears throat> being very uh, high in society. But it's only a temporary idea, it's only a temporary feeling. It's here for the time that you have it, and then no sooner do you have it, then, for example, you've, you, you set a goal to earn a million dollars. Now you have the million. And, and now uh, there are other people who have a million. So you want to over, outdo the person who has the one million and now have two million. So life becomes a pursuit of nothing less than trying to be a lord of all we survey. Wherever we look, wherever we go, we want to feel important, we want to feel valuable, great. And so what, and great. And so what happens is that, is that we develop these uh, attachments, these addictions. And each time that we develop some particular attachment or particular addiction, it's very much like, for example, if you take a rope, and you tie it around your body and you would tie it to a tree. And every time you develop another attachment, it's like another loop around the tree in your body. You're, we're tying ourselves to the material world. After a while, you have thousands of coils of rope, which are thousands of different attachments that we have. Attachments to certain clothes, attachments to certain vehicles, attachment to certain people, certain places, and we feel that these attachments somehow are absolutely necessary when really they're not. They're not necessary. We become attached because there's some pleasure attached to it. So what's being said in this particular verse is that the reason that we become attached, the reason we develop these pleasures, and the reason we fall into this bondage in the material world is that we are missing something very important and that is the pleasure which comes from connecting with or being in contact with the Supreme Lord. This is what's missing. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, one who is not connected with me in Krishna consciousness can have... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> One who is not connected with me in Krishna consciousness can have neither transcendental intelligence nor a steady mind, without which there is no possibility of peace. And how can there be any happiness without peace? So he said, if you're not connected with me in Krishna consciousness, we're all connected with God. Krishna is another name of God, just as Jesus is another name of God. Vishnu is another name of God. Uh, <clears throat> 
Krishna has so many different names like Govinda, Gopal, so many. Uh, it's not so much the, the name, what's most important is that <clears throat> is that what Krishna comes for and gives these teachings is to revive our consciousness of our connection, our relationship with God. Just as we're all having a relationship of a sort tonight, like I'm giving a discourse and we all know one another, we talk to one another, we relate to one another on the basis of our philosophy, on the basis of our likes, on the basis of our uh, dislikes, on the basis of our, our understandings, so Krishna is saying that the, what, the reason that I come to this world, he mentions it, he says, whenever and wherever there's a decline in religious practice, I come down here. So my business is to try to revive your consciousness of me. Not just on Sunday when you go to church, but he's saying every moment of your life. He says, this is what's really missing. He, said, he says that it's most important and he says, in, uh, to be always aware of me. And he says, engage your mind always in thinking of me. Become my devotee. Offer your homage unto me. Thus completely absorbed in me, surely you will come to me. He says, you need to practice or develop the habit of thinking of me. And there are nine different ways which are given in our scriptures which you can do that, such as we, we were doing before, chanting God's holy names the Hare Krishna mantra. So that's hearing the name of the Lord. When you hear it, or chanting the name of the Lord, remembering God, uh, just remembering Him, serving His feet. If you have deities or images, you we have these deities, we wash the feet of the Lord, and in washing the feet, that's a a form of devotional service, um, offering prayers to God. When you offer prayers regularly and offer them from the heart, I mean there are standard scriptural prayers and then there are personal prayers. So when you do personal prayers and you open up your heart and you express your, uh, yourself to the Supreme Lord and you act like his child, says, I need your help, I need your guidance, I need your direction, please guide me, please help me. So then God listens, he's in the heart. In the Catholic religion it's called the, the Holy Spirit. And in the Krishna conscious movement we call him the super soul, it's the same thing. <clears throat> super soul is another manifestation of, of God who is in every heart, everyone Every creature he's in. Every atom of creation he's in. There is not a speck of space where God does not exist. He's everywhere. But we're generally unconscious of that uh, presence. As soon as we begin to associate with him through uh, the ways that I've just been mentioning, and there are others, there's offering prayers and there's worship, and uh, there is practical devotional service, such as as Gina was doing he was at the cash register in the in the temple today, and uh, people were purchasing their lunch, and he was greeting them with a nice smile and saying very nice affectionate words to them. So this is service. Anytime you get a chance to do service, whether you're cleaning or whether you're an executive, or whether you're in some way offering, um, offering knowledge, or your intelligence, offering guidance, offering money, or funds, uh, any way that you get a chance to serve the church or the temple, which is the means by which God's words gets out there to the people. So when you support that, when you help that, when you assist it, then God is pleased with you. And when He is pleased with your service, assuming that you're doing this not for some personal gain, 
by personal gain, I mean that uh, people may uh, glorify you, or maybe somebody will pay you some money to do this, or give you a gift, or uh, some gain is there, but you're doing it simply and only because you know that God deserves to be served. He is all powerful, He is all loving, He is all kind. He feeds us, He clothes us, He shelters us, He guides us, He gives us help for medication when we need it, He gives us good company, He puts us in touch with people who can uh, give us uh, protection or can give us uh, relief. So God is there always helping us, always guiding us. And therefore, he deserves to receive our love. And we are in debt to the Lord. So our debt is, is great because just as we're sitting here and, and we're all together here and there's no interference, there's no noises, we don't even have any dogs barking tonight. <laughs> Last time we had dogs barking on cue. <laughs> So, <clears throat> so this is uh, external peace. But internal peace is really what everyone needs. You can go and take a yoga class and you can feel uh, really wonderful after the hour or the hour and a half. Your body's been stretched, your mind has been calm, your emotions have been balanced, and uh, it lasts for an hour, two hours, three hours, and then th your old anxieties start to begin to percolate. And we begin to uh, have our, the same things that we're worried about. Am I going to lose my job? Am I going to lose my unemployment insurance? Uh, am I gonna, is, my, uh, is my husband going to remain with me? Uh, are my relatives, one of them is in the hospital, is he or she going to die? All of these different questions arise in our minds because we're not really at peace. But when we come to know Krishna, when we come to know the Supreme Lord, when we associate with God, now Krishna says that I and my name are non-different. And Jesus himself says, hallowed be thy name. What does that mean? It means your name is sacred. And why is it sacred? Because God is in his name. <clears throat> Being in his name, you associate <coughs> with him. For example, if I shake your hand, there's some association there. So the Lord has mercifully injected himself or invested himself in his own name. So that when we chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, we associate with the Supreme Lord. And as we more and more associate with the Supreme Lord, we are associating with purity. We are associating with peace. We're associating with love on the transcendental level, on the eternal level, not on the material level. Transcendental means I am chanting to please you, Lord. I am chanting for your glory, Lord. I am chanting to develop my love for you so that I can offer more to you so that I can offer you a better quality of service, if possible. I'm chanting to obtain your grace so that I can be a better servant. I can perhaps share the knowledge that you've given me with somebody else who needs this knowledge, who's suffering, who's anxious, who's worried, who's uncertain, who's full of doubts. So, therefore, the uh, important uh, point is that we develop this association because by associating with the Lord who's divine energy and what we normally manifest is what we call material energy which manifests as lust and anger and greed and envy and illusion and gluttony and you know, all those wonderful things that we're all heir to uh, so we become attached to all of these things and they rule our lives and as a result of being ruled by uh, material objects and being attached to them, being enslaved by them, and feeling that they're indispensable for us to, to have, we feel we can't live without them, this is, this is most unfortunate because that's an illusion. 
You can live without your chocolate bar for a day. You can live without living, riding, driving a Mercedes. Life does go on without a Mercedes. It will go on in a Ford. <laughs> and it will go on in a Toyota. Uh, uh, the thing is, is we begin to form one illusion you know, after another. And we become so uh, hung up on those illusions that we begin to lose our perspective of what reality is. We think reality is simply a, a bundle of all sorts of attachments and simply by fulfilling those attachments or satisfying them as it mentions over here that somehow we will be peaceful. Well for a few seconds you are because you had an ambition, you had a desire, you had a, a, an urge and you're able to satisfy it. Okay, what comes after that satisfaction? Another urge, which has to be satisfied. And until the other urge is satisfied, we're in anxiety, we're in uncertainty, we're in doubt. And then finally, you know, it's satisfied, we feel happy for a few moments. And that's what most of material life is like. And it's most unfortunate because we've just become a bundle of these different uh, attachments and it prevents us from actually getting to the reality which is God himself and as I said God is in our hearts he's in every heart and when we learn how to associate with the Supreme Lord through as I said the chanting of the Holy Name meditating on his form reading his uh, his uh, divine words which as I'm reading here What happens is that we accumulate what we call good karma. Karma means action. And good action is action which leads us towards God. And bad action is action which takes us away from God. And pulls us deeper and deeper into the vortex or the cycle or the um, whirlpool of illusion. And if you go deeper and deeper illusion, it's, it seems impossible to be able to get out of it. It's like, it's, how do I get out of this? You can't even know, see that there was this, there's an outside. And so what Krishna is saying here in, in, this, uh, in this very, very important verse is that we need to associate with him more and more. And by associating with him more and more, the impurities in our hearts become slowly but surely washed away. It's, for example, the soul is covered with all sorts of uh, impurities, which I've already mentioned, in the form of personal uh, <clears throat> selfishness, or self-centeredness, the things that we're thinking of I and me and mine, this belongs to me, this is mine, this is mine. Uh, and so what we need to go to is the opposite. What can I offer to you, Lord? What can I give you, Lord? How can I serve you, Lord? How can I love you, Lord? And there are different forms. I've already said worship is one form. And offering food to the Lord. Offering your home to the Lord. Actually, a devotee learns to consider since everything comes from God, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, ego, all together, these, Krishna says, these are my eight separated material energies. They all belong to the Lord, and he's allowing us to use them. So we need to recognize that the, the home is not my home. The home belongs to Krishna, it's his home. But as long as we think of it as my home, if somebody says something opposed to it or against it or doesn't like it, we become upset because we're identifying ourselves. This is, this is me. First identification is the body. This is me. And then there are whatever the body is associated with or whatever it connects with, whether it's one's family, or whether it's one's city, whether it's one's country, one feels that that is an extension of himself or herself. And that extension, anytime it's threatened, for example, you have a child, or if the child becomes sick, is an extension of you. 
And therefore you become a little upset, a little antsy, a little disturbed when the child is coughing or the child is sneezing mm -hmm. or the child is itching. It's as if you're itching, you're, you're, you're coughing, and you have almost that same anxiety, that same uh, uh, upset. So the point is that, is, that, is that everything in this material world is not ours. It all belongs to God. It all belongs to Him. He is the owner. He is the possessor of everything. And once we begin to recognize this, that He owns it all, including our body, our mind, our intelligence, whatever comes out of them belongs to Him. Because he's given us the intelligence. Normally we think, well, I did this creation. That's my creation. That's my. So, you know, a person doesn't like your painting, doesn't like your, 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 your play, doesn't like your book, thinks it's terrible and starts criticizing, you get upset, you get disturbed. Because you consider that to be an extension of your little body self. And being an extension of your body self, that you feel that little self is being threatened by the criticism. Ultimately, we fear death. And when somebody criticizes us, it's a form of death. It feels like we're being uh, harmed. Because we, we feel that unless we're complimented or glorified or honored, that we don't feel like a Lord. But actually, our business is to be the servant of the Lord. That is our real constitutional position, to serve God to love Him, to honor Him, to glorify Him, bow down to Him, share Him, and honor Him. So all these are a part of living uh, in a <coughs> positive, uh, devotional, and divine method. So Sri Prabhupada has come and he's brought this uh, of cleansing the heart of all of those lower qualities, and once the heart, or the soul, I should say, is cleansed of them, then what happens is that it can then begin to experience, in connection with Krishna, in connection with God, it can experience its own inner bliss, its own inner peace. It's already there in a dormant form. And it needs to be stimulated. And the only thing that can stimulate our dormant bliss, our dormant happiness, dormant uh, joy, is to be in contact with God. And when we are in contact, when we're associating with Him, then what happens is that the dirt which is covering the soul is gradually washed away. And as it's washed away, then you have the pure soul, and the pure soul, in connection with God, is that soul is stimulated by God's spiritual energy. So when the Lord is manifesting that spiritual energy, what happens is that um, He injects His love into the soul. And the soul is, is made of three principles. Eternal bliss, eternal peace, and eternal knowledge, or existence. So once that is galvanized or in stimulated, then one begins to feel inner bliss, inner joy. This does not depend on anything external. It comes from within. And that's exactly what uh, this verse is focusing on. It's saying, don't try to satisfy all your material desires. Or if you do satisfy them, try to understand that the more you become attached the more you become addicted, the more you become controlled, the more you become enslaved, the more you become bound up to this world, and the result will be is you will have to take another birth in this material world and again be uh, get attached to those same things that you were attached to in your previous life. And what happens is that you never get to know real happiness, real bliss, real peace, real strength, real confidence, real love, because we're not making that connection with the Supreme Lord. That's really what our business is. So all of the chanting that we do, reading these scriptures, and glorifying the 
great personalities or great saintly persons, all of these things help us to gain the favor of God. And as I said, when He is pleased with us, which is really what, we, what our business is, is to give pleasure to God. And if we give pleasure to Him, and He injects His pleasure back into us, then we will also feel pleasure, but it will come <clears throat> from Him as opposed to coming from some sense object. As it is said, an intelligent person does not take part in the sources of misery which are due to contact with the material senses. Such pleasures from the senses have a beginning and an end, and the wise person doesn't delight in them. What does he delight in? He delights in the pure pleasure of serving the Supreme Lord, of loving the Lord, trying to please the Lord, and if the Lord sees fit, to express his love or in a form of reciprocation for what he's received, then the devotee feels great happiness, great strength, great... He doesn't need anyone or anything. He's always happy. It doesn't depend on the weather, like, you know, you have a blizzard, like they're having at least. That will not make you unhappy. You'll just deal with it. Is that the, well, what happens? You know, do you become emotionless? No. Your emotions are all connected and directed <coughs> towards loving service of the Lord. You cook for the Lord. You wear clothes for the Lord. You drive your car for the Lord. Everything is for Him. So, therefore, if we allow ourselves to become hung up on material desires, then three types of misery will occur. Those which occur from our own body and mind, those which come from other living entities, other persons, and those which come from the cataclysms and catastrophes such as fire, snow, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. These come from uh, natural disasters. Actually, they're not natural at all. They come from our old bad karma. So we can overcome all these three different kinds of miseries by becoming more and more Krishna conscious. That's what it requires. And the more we do things which are of a Krishna conscious nature, the more you think of the Lord, and whatever you're doing, the more you will become Krishna conscious. The way a devotee does this, in mentally, internally, whatever he does, he says, I'm walking for you, Lord. I'm eating for you, Lord. I'm driving for you, Lord. Everything becomes a sacrament, in a sense. Okay? Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions that any of you might have that I may try to answer? Okay. Can I just interrupt for a second? We're going to start the heating up and getting ready for the food for Sarah. Yeah, I'm so then, And uh, I'm we want you to have time just, hmm? to talk about your books and... Uh, oh, yes, I, I, I have these... Uh, uh, which you see on the table, there are uh, audio books of Srila Prabhupada's <coughs> books. If you like to uh, listen to them, and some, some people like to do it while they're in the car, while they're cooking. You can do other things. You can hear the scripture, and they're done... Uh, in, in some of them in a dramatic fashion, some in a non-dramatic way. I have the Bhagavad Gita, I have the complete one, I have also just the translations, and I have the, uh, so many of the different books that Srila Papa wrote, and I make them very easy. I also have a few of my own books, which are entry-level books on uh, how to get into Krishna consciousness, stories from our scriptures, so they are available there. And uh, I have a catalog sheet there. Please avail yourself of them. And uh, I also have a, a USB, which uh, Bob Darren got. And uh, it has everything that I've ever uh, narrated. Uh, it's on that one USB. You can plug it into your computer. And you can uh, use it that way. The whole Srimad Bhagavatam is there, the whole Chaitanya Charitamrita, Nectar of Devotion, Nectar of Instruction, Sri Ishwapanishads, and on and on and on. So I hope you'll be able to take advantage of, uh, of these. Uh, I've, I've done them to make it a little easier. Sometimes our eyes get a little tired and you can't read, but if you've got your ears open, you can hear, 
uh, many people go to sleep just listening to these wonderful uh, narrations of these books. And I hope that all of you will avail yourself of the uh, opportunity to have it. Again, thank you so much. I know part two. If there are no questions, everything's set in place. So our goal is to become more God conscious. Our goal is to perform God conscious activities. The goal is to please Krishna. Uh, and in so doing, uh, we become purified, and that purification results in transcendental peace and bliss, strength, and love. Thank you.